Welcome to Distrust and Disparities, Dismantling Black Health Disparities podcast. We examine health disparities that disproportionately affect Black women and Black families. In addition, we amplify organizations and individuals working to dismantle racist health practices and systems to improve health outcomes for marginalized communities. I'm your host, Jasmine Moore, a registered nurse, and I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Camille White. That's why the work that y'all do is so important. Um, The conversations being had is important. And, you know, this book is important. And it's just, these are little, these are just little steps in the right direction. And I think that, you know, if we keep it up, we really can make large scale change. In this episode, we continue our interview with Brittany Daniels, a Black queer travel nurse, social advocate, and author. Brittany demonstrates the importance of speaking up and advocating for yourself and your patients in her book, Journal of a Black Queer Nurse. Brittany is a very smart and driven nurse, someone who I would want to care for myself or for a loved one. You go above and beyond for your patients and you have a wealth of knowledge and experience. And you talked about how you began writing down your experiences and what's going on as a way to like cover yourself if anything was to come in. So how did this transition into you writing a book? And the book that Brittany wrote is titled Journal of a Queer Black Nurse. So can you tell us about this transition from just journaling, writing down like what's going on to releasing a book? Yeah. So like, like you said, you know, starting, I I carried this little leatherette, you know, journal with me in my pocket. And honestly, it just started off as like remembering epinephrine one to 1000 versus one to 10,000, right? Remembering um, specific uh, medications that are important to know the difference between, uh, you know, passwords and things like that. Right. And Honestly, the transition happened when I heard the doctor say what he said, where I was like, wow, this is bad. And I need to make sure that I need to make sure that I'm remembering and taking the time to really process how I feel about what I'm seeing, you know, and the transition also happened when I realized that the trauma coming from work doesn't just uh, include what I'm seeing happen in the patient rooms, you know, when I'm seeing folks who are harmed, when I'm seeing folks who are abused, when I'm watching people pass away, unfortunately, that's not the only trauma that I take home with me. It's the way that other people are treated. And it's the way that patients are treating me. It's the way that patients are questioning me. It's the way that I literally have to tread so gently and so carefully around the medical providers that are working alongside me, um, around the patients, around the patient's families, everyone that I come across, you know, to the point where like, if I'm giving a report to a nurse upstairs, you know, if they pick up on my black scent, you know, they, they start being like, well, did you do like, I can just hear their, I can hear their tone change and I can, I, you know, I start getting the the questions of, did you even do this? Did you even do that? You know, not just a simple, did you, but did you even, you know, I, I can just, yeah. So, so realizing that, Hey, this stuff is hard. It's hard to spend the time processing those thoughts and feelings at work. So I knew I needed to do it outside of work and, you know, what better way to really reflect than to sit and journal, you know, after I've taken, uh, usually it would take place after I've gotten home, taken my shower and settled down. But sometimes in really, you know, intense situations, um, whether that's like a medical situation or, uh, you know, a social situation, I had to write, write it down right then and there so that I made sure that I spent the time processing my feelings later on. And I have a, I pulled out a quote in which you basically explained. And it says, simply put, as a black queer nurse, I felt like I was permanently on thin ice. So that sums yes. up everything that you're going through. And 
like I mentioned in the beginning, nursing is uplifted as this the most trusted field and things like that. But you also have phrases as nurses eat their young. Like that is also <laughs> associated with the profession. And there's so much bullying going on in the field. And it needs to be talk, talked about. Every This should be a must read for all nurses, like to look at these stories to be dissected and compounded because it's not talked about what's going on. And like you said, we're here to help the patients in order for the healthcare system to work um, optimally as it should be. We need to be working as a team from nurses to like your nurse managers um, to interacting with doctors. It all takes a weld oil machine. We all need to be able to trust each other. But when you're letting your biases and race, outright racism, just get in the way. And in the book, multiple times, you go to your nurse manager and you let them know what's going on. And one, that takes courage. They don't teach you that in school. They say, you know, you got to advocate for yourself, but they don't tell you how to exactly do it. And two, they don't tell you what to do when nothing is being done. Like, it's hard because I've been there. I was like, oh, this is going on. And then like the manager, they'd be like, well, what did you do? They want to insect. Like, did you mm-hmm. do X, Y, and Z? Did you do this and that? Versus if it's a problem with a doctor or so many times, oh, that's the that's just that doctor. That's just how it is. It shouldn't be like that. Like you said, it's harming patients. It's making a toxic environment. People don't want to work with this individual. Yeah, it it, it does make it really toxic. And honestly, I think that, I think you're absolutely right. They don't teach you how hard it is to to stand up and advocate for yourself and for other people in in nursing. Um, That should be a whole class in and of itself, right? Also, one of the things that I noticed at one of the hospitals where I felt like I had the most problems with uh, like a specific person, it felt like the more I, because I w- I'm an email person, right? You're going to get a strongly worded email with times and dates, right? When there's an issue. Mm-hmm. I got receipts. Receipts. Yes. 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 And it felt like the more receipts I had, the more the manager avoided me. Um, it became, it became, mm-hmm. you know, it started off cause I won, I won, uh, or I was nominated for a Daisy at this hospital, you know? And so that was tw- like probably the first three weeks or so of my contract. And so she was, you know, Hey, Brittany, great job. You, you, you did great. You know, let's take a picture, whatever. But then after that, you know, after email, after email, after email of me saying, Hey, this is not okay. Patients should not be called names by doctors. Patients should not be, you know, uh, accused of of um, being an addict behind their back by a doctor. I shouldn't hear these conversations at the nurses station. This is not what I should be hearing. This is not how an attending should be speaking in front of residents and med students, right? Because it all starts from there, right? Mm-hmm. They're they're being molded by these people. And so it felt like the more emails I would send, you know, I would get the thank you for bringing this up email back. But then every time I saw the manager after that, it felt like she would avoid eye contact. Um, And so for me, it just felt like I understand that the retaliation, you know, isn't necessarily the issue here, but it seems like, you know, you're just flagging me as a troublemaker um, instead of focusing on what the issue is, which is the person that I'm emailing you about. Because that's what it is of like now it's like, oh, don't don't even engage with Brittany now because she's probably going to come up with something else to say. Mm-hmm. She's going to be sending another email instead of like actually looking into it and Coming from an HR background, I know that they're supposed to have policies in place and they're supposed to follow a procedure of if someone brings this to your attention, you need to follow it through. But a lot of times then because of the culture, because of those higher up executives, those who are in charge, when that never happens, people can go about doing whatever they want to do. And then someone who is sort of stuck in that lower position where you don't really have any control over anything you then feel like I got to go. I can't, I can't do this anymore because that's another part of like 
nursing already causes burnout for so many other reasons. But then the simple fact that like you can't even go to report an issue and actually be handled because people just don't want to address it. They don't care. And I think that also plays into like, because you're complaining about, you know, some attending that has all this power and influence where it's like, if it was some other sort of not in the hierarchy of how it's all is some lower uh, professional in the field, they would probably be doing something or they might be firing them, but because they're also lifted up on a pedestal within your workplace, nothing is done. Which is like, they're not gods. They're not, but people treat them like that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like also media does that as well. And it's just like, no. Okay. They went to school longer. They have like some more knowledge about some things and they do surgery. That's great. They're still a regular person that can be trash ass human beings and they need to be put in check. Like, yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. I had a patient, she was about to go to surgery and, you know, she was really nervous and I was just confronting her and everything. And, you know, she wanted to like say a prayer. And I was like, yes, you know, we can say a prayer. Doctor, in the middle of the prayer, the doctor comes in, barges in and it's like, oh, we need to do this. No respect of what we're doing. We're like, we're in the middle of like a prayer. And then he says, oh, no need to pray. You're, you're with us. Oh. Yes. <laughs> oh like, my God. I was like this this happened years ago and I will never forget this story. How insensitive. Right? So insensitive. Like wow. I can't imagine too as the patient where like that is something so important to them. And then here you go, like comforting them and helping them do that. And then the person who will be doing whatever the procedure is coming. Immediately, it's like the cockiness. I get that you need to have confidence, especially when, you know, you're doing something that like if you make a mistake, someone's life could be over. But it's the cockiness. It's the arrogance. And it's like you don't walk on water. If you respect me that little while I'm awake and praying, Mm. how much are you going to respect me when I'm intubated and sedated? Mm. Like none, none at all. Exactly. I'm I'm trying to think. I remember years ago, some news story of like they were filming, I guess, surgeries and the things that they heard doctors and other professionals in the room say. And then people who are there, of course, who like don't agree can't speak up because they're not the doctor they're not the surgeon Mm -hmm. and it was just like oh my god the nasty disgusting racist horrible things people will say while you are unconscious as though you're you're not a human Mm -hmm. being as though you don't matter and it's just it's so heartbreaking you said when people are unconscious people they are being disrespectful when the patients are awake (laughs) and It's crazy being disrespectful to patients and also being disrespectful to us as nurses. And um, you have plenty of stories in your book about this. So it's just not it's not just when patients are asleep. They feel emboldened and entitled to say this to their face, to their face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was actually going to mention that um, I had my my really great friend who actually helped me, the CRNA that I talked about in the book that passed away, she told me a story about she had really severe asthma and she had been intubated multiple times. She told me a story where she got rushed to the ER for having an asthma exacerbation. They had to intubate her and they sedated her and she could still hear. Mm-hmm. She could hear. She was, you know, she was paralyzed, sedated. She could still hear. And she heard one of the nurses say, this fat black woman does not take care of herself. Why doesn't this fat black woman take care of herself? She said it multiple times. And so do you know that when she was discharged from the hospital, she walked her butt right on down to the ER and was like, I need to speak to somebody. And she remembered the accent of the mm-hmm. nurse. The nurse had a very specific accent. Mm-hmm. And she was like, "Who? You know, whose voice sounds like this, whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. They were able to find the nurse. And she was able to report her. She, like, she should never even be in that position. And, like, why? She's are you dying. Dying. And oh, that's what you, you're thinking. Oh, let me be racist and mm-hmm. fat phobic all at the same time. Because Ooh. that's what's on my mind. Where it's just like, you're not paying attention to the fact that you need to help save her. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And this is very frustrating and disheartening. Because I just think, if I was to say 
half of what I'm, you know, how I want to respond. You know, if I, you can't even. Gone. You mentioned in the book, like as a black woman, you have to hold yourself to certain standards. You have to work 10 times as harder and you have people getting away with saying any kind of thing, doing any kind of thing. And it's frustrating and it needs to be addressed. Like, I'm glad we're having this conversation on this podcast, but it needs to be talked about and something needs to be done now. Like, Incidents like this need to be stopped. They need to be confronted head on. But so many people are afraid to confront, you know, the big doctor, the big people. The people want to, like, climb the ladder and things like that. But this system that we are working in, it's toxic. It's Definitely. very toxic. Have you checked out our website? There you can find all of our episodes and show notes. You can even listen directly on the site and catch up on any previous episode you may have missed. You can read our bios and see what we're up to. Also, we made it even easier to contact us. Just fill out the form on our homepage and click submit. We invite you to recommend guests and topics we should feature. So what are you waiting for? Go check us out at distrustanddisparities.com. And then segue into 2020 and you throw a pandemic on top of that. Like the COVID-19 pandemic was an extremely difficult time, but it was extremely hard for those working in healthcare and just essential workers. We didn't know what was happening, but we still had to show up and give it all despite our fears. And it was even harder being Black during this time because you were fighting a battle on two fronts, going to the hospital, fighting to keep patients alive. And then when you get off, you have to deal with the senseless murders of Black people such as George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Like this time was very hard and very traumatic. And can you just talk to like your experience during this time, during the pandemic? Yes. Um, I think that during the pandemic was, and, and on top of being, you know, Black and queer and working in, in a pandemic, you know, I was away from my family. You know, I was in California and my family was in Chicago. Uh, and so prior to COVID, I was going home every month. I would fly home, hang out with everybody, fly back every single month. And so that that abruptly got cut off. And, you know, I feel like um, I was lucky to have the internet, right? So I could, you know, zoom in with my family and, and folks from home and just sort of uh, decompress and talk about uh, the murders of George Floyd, the murders of the murder of uh, Breonna Taylor and things like that, because it was a really, really difficult time um, for all of us. Um, specifically regarding work, though, as you know, you know, I work in the emergency department. Um, it was weird. You know, at first it felt like it wasn't busy at all because everyone was staying home, but then the nursing homes got hit. And so it was just back to back codes. And we only had um, three defibrillators in the emergency department. And it got to a point where we were like, Hey man, I need that defibrillator. Like your patient's been coding for 30 minutes and mine just got here. Like you got it, you know, like just having to sort of ration everything. But then you know, always lurking is the 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 racism and the bias uh, within the folks who work in medicine, and so just hearing things like I was I was uh, training um, with a nurse who told me that oh George Floyd wasn't even murdered that's a hoax it's not even real those videos are fake right and being like in a situation where I want to say so much to him, but knowing exactly what will happen if I say it. Right. Um, in the meantime, you know, folks are, you know, the violence that always existed in the area that I was working in was still um, present. And so people are coming in with injuries and, you know, a lot of it, I didn't, inc I did not include in the book, um, but some of it I did. And one of those incidences, a nurse, a nurse got upset because the patient was, you know, yelling out for pain meds. And he told him, you know, bro, like, shut up. That's why you got shot. And I was in a patient's room at the time. And the patient looks at me. I look at the patient and she's like, did you hear that? Like you, did, 
you heard what I heard and I heard what you heard, right? It was one of those moments. And, and so, you know, just dealing with, you know, we're in a pandemic. Um, people can't come see their, their uh, loved ones when they're sick, when they're dying, they still can't come see them. Um, you know, this is pre-vaccine. So there's nothing anyone can do. Um, you know, and folks are just, are, are just ignorant. Um, on top of, you know, the, the, the racism and the discrimination that was still present in the hospital during COVID, you know, there weren't enough staff, you know, some people were saying, I'm not coming to work. I'm not risking my family, you know? And so at that point I was literally rolling bodies into body bags and Jasmine, you know how difficult it is to get a body in a body bag. You know, folks are heavy. Um, and so you're having to roll them side to side, tuck this bag under them, get them in the bag. And all the while you're thinking to yourself, God, they're alone. The, you know, their family can't be here. And the next time they'll see them is, you know, when they're at the funeral, if there will be a funeral, right? Because... Mm -hmm people can't get together and gather. And so it's just one of those things where, you know, that just added an extra layer of uh, physical strain and emotional strain to everything. And then, you know, that was all just piled on top of feeling like you're always having to watch your back. <laughs> that never goes away, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, really hard during the pandemic because I worked in the emergency department was working a contract in Long Island and I was working four 12 hour night shifts. And Oof. the way it was, I was end up doing like four in a row sometimes like that. And like you said, it was just back to back and patients are dying. I remember somebody died. They were just on the phone with their family member and we're like, Oh, we'll call you back to give you updates. And then you're like, man, I, we can't even, the next call, you got to call and let them know that their loved one had passed. And they're like, we were just talking to them, like, what happened? And things like not having enough equipment, not having like enough masks, gowns. And it's like, I'm here. I still got to work. I still got to go in. I got to keep wearing this like same mask and just like, you know, shift after shift. And it was one point like, um, like the oxygen kept beeping, kept beeping at this hospital. I'm like, what is going on? What is like this alarm? And they were like, we're running out of oxygen. Like the oxygen is low because we had so many people intubated and on ventilators. And I was like, what? I'm like, I didn't even know you could run out of oxygen. Right? And you're describing your book. You had to like transport patients to the morgue. You're finding out like the morgue is full. I'm coding people next to bodies and it's just like, oh my gosh. And then, like you said, you go on your break and then people are talking about, look at these people. They're out here looting. They're doing this. You know, why are they out there protesting? And it's just like, <laughs> you can't <laughs> like get like any decompression or anything. It, it was just an insane time to be like a healthcare worker. And I remember one time, like you said, when people stopped coming to like the emergency department because they were scared to come in, they floated me to the ICU. And that was like the most depressing like experience. I never realized how much I like to like interact and like talk with patients. I right. love like the mix when everybody is on a ventilator when people are like, you know, lying face down on ventilators on 10 million drips. It's like, oh my gosh, it's like so scary. So yeah. like depressing. And then I just wanted to, you know, just have this conversation because it was um, a very, very hard time. This like experience. This it was, was really it was, tough. it was surreal. And like thinking, I mean, I was lucky enough um, to have been uh, renting a bedroom in a house of one of the nurses. So mm. I was so, I was so grateful um, because 
we were all medical providers, um, me, her and her husband, you know, so we're, you know, we know the drill, you know, get home, change your clothes in, uh, in the uh, garage, run to the shower. You know, we had, I had a little bit of a, a community and I'm forever grateful for that because I can't imagine how isolating it would have been to have been back in my apartment by myself with just me and my dog, um, which is what I was doing right before uh, the pandemic. But it was it was terrifying. And like you said, you know, taking bodies to the morgue, you know, I was working in 90 degree weather, you know, and if the morgue is full, the only other place to put pa- patients is in hallways and it's hot, you know, mm-hmm. it's hot and they, they deserve better. You know, they deserve better. Their loved ones deserve better. And it was just it was such a difficult time. And you would think that in a, in a time like that, that people would think we really need to come together. We really mm-hmm. need to to uh, to lead with love and and everything that we do. But instead, you know, it felt like the the George Floyd murder really caused a divide. And then we could even go as far as like this trickled into twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, right? Where Kyle Rittenhouse was acquitted, and I'm dealing with people cracking jokes about that. And I'm you mm. know I'm it's just it's disgusting. You know, mm-hmm. and I will say during this period, I know in the emergency department, like after a cold and, you know, after a patient passes away, we have what's called like a debrief, a debriefing. And that's like where we take a few minutes to like honor the patient's life and just discuss like the diligent efforts that we put in to save this patient's life. And it's a time for loved ones to um, honor their um family member and also for us in the healthcare profession to process what happened. But during COVID, we didn't have that time to process what was going on. We were constantly on to the next person, on to the next person. And like you said, um, millions of people lost their lives to COVID-19. And it felt like in the news with like the whole Trump circus, it diminished this fact. And as a country, I don't think we've completely recognized the significance of surviving a pandemic or the sheer amount of people that were lost. It was this constant, let's get back to normal, let's get back to normal. And I kept saying this, why are we in a rush to get back to normal? Like what we were doing on a normal day-to-day basis was racist, it was class classes, mm-hmm. homophobic. In healthcare, we weren't saving people, people were dying. And so it was just like, we, we should look, take this time to reflect and see what we can do better. I just want to know, did you have this sense? Like, why are we in such a rush to get back to normal? Like, can we recover from this? And, you know, what can we do right? Because a nurse and I have 15 patients at baseline, like in New York, in some areas, because what if all 15 of your patients are sick with COVID, which is what happened? Yep, exactly. Mm-hmm. No, I definitely was thinking the same thing throughout. It's just, why aren't we just reevaluating what we were doing and what was going on, right? When you look at the the disproportionate amount of Black people and poor people who were affected yes. and died from COVID mm-hmm. versus people, you know, rich white folks, uh, upper middle class folks, you know, that, that didn't trigger, uh, hold on, mm-hmm. maybe we need to talk about this, right? Maybe we need to discuss why you know, multiple generations are having to live together in the black and brown community and in these mm-hmm. poor communities. Maybe we should discuss why these folks didn't have access to, to medical care, why they didn't have access to their asthma and inhal- their asthma pumps, their inhalers, you know, things like that. Um, but instead, everyone just wants to, you know, <laughs> to get back to what what affects them. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's just that a lot of people are, have been viewing this through a very selfish lens um, and wanting to get back to what they were doing, wanting to get back to what they want to do uh, instead of thinking about the collective. It was just, it was terrible. And I know after the pandemic, I really had to take time, take a step back and, you know, think about what I was doing, what I, what I wanted to do moving forward because I know I was I was just depressed and I was not happy at my job and just everything that was going on. And I would say the pandemic was like the peak of burnout for me as well as other nurses. And I felt like I was working so hard and I wasn't really making a difference. Like mm-hmm. I was, you know, 
I needed more time to be able to spend with the patients, to properly educate them, to prevent them from having to come come back. And I just felt like I did not have enough time to do this. And honestly, I was seriously contemplating finding something else to do. And I didn't want to be a part of a system that was more concerned with profits over patients than their own staff members. You know, they didn't care about patients. They didn't care about staff. You know, the CEOs of the hospitals are, you know, on Zoom telling us, hang in there, hang in there, you know, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wear trash bags and you'll be fine. But you're at home with your you're, family. You're on your yacht. What are you talking about? Right. <laughs> it's just, it's crazy. Yeah. And I'll pull a quote from your book. It says, my tears were a product of my disappointment in the healthcare system that I'm a part of. I found myself questioning my career choice. I found myself trying to figure out how the hell am I supposed to change something that is so incredibly broken? And I was like, man, I felt, I feel this like, I know you do just like, you're just frustrated. Like, what can I do? So many things need to be changed, but they're not. Exactly. And I mean, honestly, that this is like, that's why the work that y'all do is so important. Um, the conversations being had is important. And, you know, the, this book is important. And it's just, these are little, these are just little steps in the right direction. And I think that, you know, if we keep it up, we really can make large scale change. And that's, you know, part of the reason why I decided like, okay, yeah, I'll keep going to school is because I want to figure out, you know, how can I really affect change in the community, especially the community that I live in in Chicago, right? Um, it's, it's, it's hard here for people of color. Um, you know, people love to talk about how diverse Chicago is, but it's so segregated. It is so segregated. Um, and it, it's the, the redlining history here, it runs deep and it's very, very present, like from block to block. If you were to just drive uh, down, you know, let's just say like California, if you drive down California Avenue, like you can tell, um, you know, what, what parts of the city are invested in, which parts are not invested in. And, you know, health healthcare is a part of that, right? Um, when you have uh, neighborhoods that people don't invest in, the, the city doesn't invest in, you know, those folks don't have the access that they need. They don't have the education that they need. Um, and so it's just, it, it's one of those things where we got to keep, we got to keep, putting one foot in front of the other and keep doing what we're doing, um, with this, uh, with this focus of equity. And, um, you know, I actually just made a video today about the difference between equality and equity, because I hear people so often, especially in nursing, um, and there's, there's nothing wrong with this, but they say like, I treat everyone the same. I treat everyone the same. And I hear, I've been hearing that for decades. Um, and I, under, I truly understand that's coming from a good place, but it's so important to understand that not everybody needs the same. Everybody needs what they need. Everyone's needs are unique. Um, and everyone's background is so unique. Um, the three of us, although similar, we have very different needs. And so it's important to recognize that when we're approaching people, especially when we're caring for them. That reminds me of even a video I saw on Instagram of a white nurse who luckily wasn't like, I treat everyone the same because she worked in, um, I guess, on the labor and delivery unit. And so she specifically was like, I don't treat my Black patients the same. And here's why. And it was like, Thank you for putting this out there because you are also the main ones that need to be talking to each other because y'all don't want to listen to us. Thank y'all you. don't want to hear what we have to say, but like, okay, Becky, thank you. We appreciate yep. you. And like, keep making videos, keep telling people and explaining to them because she completely understood. And was just like, I know that they get treated differently. I know that they aren't respected. I know that then they are questioned if they ask for pain medication. I'm going to pay attention to when they tell me something is off, something doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to advocate for them and I'm going to invest for them, making sure that like they can go home safely with their child. And it's like, yes, because at times I get that it comes from a good place of I treat everyone the same, but then it sometimes for me wavers into that icky territory of like, I'm colorblind. And it's like, no, 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 no. I know you see the color unless you're like, and even if you're actually colorblind, you You can can still still see my color. Exactly. I'm not red. I'm not green. (laughs) You can see. So (laughs) please don't tell me that's a colorblind. Like it wavers into that territory, but like more 
And more people need to be operating in that way of, like you said, like we are all very different, but especially acknowledging the health disparities and knowing like, okay, I know that this statistic, this percentage of people in this demographic are going to experience issues sometimes out of just like the ignorance of whoever's providing care. So let me not be a part of that and let me work towards actually fixing it. And then I can educate others to be like, no, you need to pay attention. You need to listen when someone is telling you something isn't right and something feels off. You need to listen to black women when they tell you like, oh, I just had a child and I'm not feeling okay. Don't question people when they ask for pain medication, immediately assuming that someone is an addict because they're black. I have to share. I have to share a story that I did not include in the book uh, for so many reasons. But um, I once, <laughs> I once uh, was working, and there was a guy that came in homeless, um, and he came in because he was having really bad tooth pain. He was having really bad tooth pain. Okay, and you know, okay, you know, like in a lot of cultures, like black culture, they'll be like, "Oh, put some put some baking soda, baking powder, whatever." Right? <laughs> um, it, 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 so that's what he was doing. He oh. had. A, bo- a box of baking powder or baking soda, whatever it was, in mm-hmm. his pocket. And he had kept rubbing it on his tooth to try to make it feel better. And it didn't help. So he came to the ER, okay? And so what did they do? They um, injected lidocaine into his gums. Mm-hmm. And guess what? He was finally able to sleep because his pain went away. So dude is knocked out. I mean, like, <sighs> like snoring, the whole thing, yeah. right? And all of a sudden... All of a sudden, I see a bunch of security guards outside his room, and there's like a bunch of nurses, doctors. I'm like, what is going on? So I'm nosy. You know, I go, it wasn't my patient. It wasn't my patient, but I I knew this guy's story, so I wanted to make sure everything was okay. What happened was, because he was asleep, um, and they couldn't, you know, easily wake him up to discharge him, they were like, oh, he must be high. Uh Then they were like, oh, there's white powder all over his stuff. That must be cocaine or hair, or, you know, or pure <laughs> fentanyl, apparently. All right. And so oh <laughs> pure God. fentanyl. All right. Of course, that's definitely what it is. We're all breathing it in right now. Right. <laughs> so then they were like, OK, so he's got this drugs, all these drugs all over his his stuff. He's high or drunk because he won't wake up. He's drooling. They put lidocaine in his mouth. He's drooling. He's so high. Let's take all his stuff while he's sleeping and lock it up and then put him in the psych unit. <gasps> oh. They decided God. all they painted this whole picture for him while he was asleep. Okay. Like, you so, didn't even take a moment to even like wait until you could talk to him. Bruh, right. Or exactly. objective. You can draw labs quickly. Thank you. <laughs> Quick Thank things you. you could do. Hello. Rub so, right. All these people with all the, I mean, collectively, probably like 30, 40 years of education. And you mm. fools are sitting here drawing all these conclusions just because he's a black man. So a homeless black man. So I go, I go in the room and I'm like, what is going on? And they're like, don't go in there. I'm like, yeah. Okay. Excuse me. So I go in the room, close the curtain. I'm like, what's going on? He goes, I don't know. I woke up and my clothes are off and they're putting my stuff in bags and I'm telling them to give me my stuff. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, first of all, sit down because you are tall and you are, you are black. So you standing up towering over them, it scares them. It doesn't matter who you are. You are a black, tall man, right? They are threatened by that. I said, these dudes have tasers. I'm not going to let them tase you. So sit down and let me get your stuff. And he's like, okay, Brittany. Okay. So he sits down. I go out there and they're like, he's high. I'm like, he's not high. You injected lidocaine into his gums. He was finally able to get some decent rest because he's not in pain anymore. And there's baking powder all over his clothes that you guys are sitting here assuming is some lethal drug, right? Like you guys are like, so I get his stuff for him. I bring it in the room. He gets stressed. I'm like, okay, now we're going to leave. Okay. I made sure he had the uh, list of free dental clinics around the area. Um, and I was like, I'm going to walk with you because we don't need any of this, right? You cannot, we cannot have you yelling at them. I know you're frustrated. Your feelings are valid. You have every reason to be frustrated. You should be frustrated. But if you yell at them, they're going to take that as an excuse to tase you, Mm -hmm. to restrain you, to keep you here, right? Call the police. So I literally had to escort 
not him. I had to escort the security guards to escort him out Mm -hmm. because I wanted to make sure that they didn't try to harm him. Because if there's one thing I've learned being in the ER is that these security guards love them some quote unquote action. Okay. And they'll do anything to get it. So having to protect these patients and keep them safe has become an integral part of my job. And that was one of them where it's just like, y'all took all the dots and just connected them completely wrong. You chose, you chose this man's story. You wrote his story for him. And this is just so frustrating and it just makes you angry. It makes you like super angry and it's just disheartening. It, like you said, it makes you not want to be a nurse. It's like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why do I have to fight, you know, people who have all these years of education and these are the conclusions that you jump to. These are the hoops and things that you draw. Like, yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. How do you, you know, just keep the faith? I know you're in school. Um, You wrote, you're in school, you wrote a book, you're going on a book tour. (laughs) Like, how do you manage it all? And just, you know, you know, what keeps you, you know, grounded and keeps you on this fight? Um, You know, situations like that, right? Seeing those outcomes and thinking of what could have happened, um, you know, if I weren't there and that scares me. Um, but knowing that I can make a difference here and there, and then knowing that, you know, if I, if I keep doing what I'm doing, um, there will eventually be, uh, so many more people, um, who see patients for who they are. There will be so many people who want to protect people and keep them safe. And eventually we'll get to a point where medicine is filled with folks who, value people from all walks of life versus people who are just trying to collect a check or people who are trying to have the, um, you know, the, the titles, right. Mm -hmm. Of MDR and all that stuff, you know, there's, I think there's, there's more of us out here than we think. And it's just a matter of, you know, making sure that everyone feels empowered um, to stand up uh, and to uh, to speak truth to power, um, regardless of what the outcome might be for them. You know, and I that's just you know that's what that's what really keeps me grounded. And and honestly, therapy <laughs> um, and you know having these conversations not just with uh, my therapist but my family and you know my wife is really you know one of my biggest supporters. And you know she just she she gets it right. And so just knowing that um, I have people around me surrounded, you know, I'm surrounded by people who who want to see Black folks thrive and who want to see us become free. And um, recently I've been uh, going to, I live, you know, I live in Chicago and there's a, a Black uh, queer uh, founded basketball club. And it's just, it's called Swish. It's a queer basketball club. And I played basketball in high school, but I haven't played a whole lot since. And honestly, just like meeting up with these folks and laughing and dancing and, you know, playing ball. And it's not like anything serious. We're not like, you know, no one's playing for money. No one's trying to get drafted. You know, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just all of us having a good time, you know, and at, and at the same time, you know, just supporting one another, uplifting one another's work. Um, you know, a lot of the group was there for my book launch and it made me feel so uh, loved and supported. And just knowing that, you know, I have a community and it's not just a, the queer community, it's the black community, it's the nursing community, it's um, social justice community. You know, there's so many of us and it's just it just takes all of us continuing to do the work that we're doing for us to all for us to all be free one day. Yes. And everybody go get the book Journal of a Black Queer Nurse. It was amazing. I really I was reading every page and I got so many things highlighted like, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. This. So please go out and support. And also to those listening, share your stories. It matters. We need to be talking about these things, discussing these things. That's why we have this podcast. So we can have those difficult conversations so that we can bring about change. Like you said, we need to change the course of healthcare. If you are enjoying this episode, you should consider buying us a coffee. Yes, a coffee. That small gesture will help us continue to create quality episodes and content. Click the buy me a coffee link 
in the show notes or check out our website at distrustanddisparities.com. You mentioned what you like to do for fun and everything. So um, we'll segue into some fun questions. <laughs> and, you know, working in the ED, um, it's you know, unpredictable. It's crazy, but you do have a lot of fun. Um, is there like a really funny story that sticks with you as a nurse? Um, <laughs> I play too much and that's just who I am. <laughs> okay. So there's two, one of them is in the book and one is not, um, one, the one that is uh, in the book is the one where the gentleman, I, I was taking care of an older white man and, uh, it, you know, I was just, rounding on him checking on him you know anything and he would go he goes yeah i need a new um i need a new diaper i'm like oh okay no problem you know i'm thinking to myself let me go get him a fresh one um we'll get him changed he goes no just bring it in i don't need any help and i'm like oh okay I'm like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay sir and as i'm about to open the door to leave he goes you know i'm not fond of your kind and i go Huh? Right. <laughs> like I'm literally like I froze. Like I felt I could feel my palms getting sweaty now. Like yeah. just thinking about it, I was just like, "Excuse me." And so I sat there debating: Am I gonna ask for clarification or not? And I'm like, you know what? Do it. So I turn around. And I go, "Can can you elaborate? Like what what is that? What do you mean?" And he goes, "Y'all y'all don't don't have the you don't have the pull up ones. Y'all's got the straps, and I don't like the straps." <laughs> I don't like the straps. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. Okay. <laughs> Perspective, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Jesus. Because no other nurse would have been like, you know, no other nurse right. would have thought that. They would have been like, oh, well, too bad. This is what we got. And me immediately was like, my kind, right? <laughs> oh, my God. And then... um. <laughs> The an example of me playing too much is just uh, my last day at one of the hospitals. I, I made a, a a really great group of friends, and on my last day, I took uh, apple juice and I put it in a urinal, and I, I was yeah, you didn't expect this, did you? And, I, <laughs> and so, of course, it looked like dark urine, right? Mm-hmm. Someone who's not very hydrated. And I'm walking by one of the nurses that I was really cool with, and. You know, I walk fast and people will tell you like I'm on a mission and my patients have to tell me to slow down, but I'm, I'm gone. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm walking, 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 and I pretend to trip and I spilled the apple juice uh, just enough, not too much, just enough on my friend's arm. And like, she just froze and she like throws her arms up and she's looking down and you could just see, she had a mask on, but I could just see how disgusted she was. And I (laughs) I was like, oh my God, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. And as soon as she's, about to, <laughs> I'm so bad. As soon as she's about to like say something, because she's trying to be nice, but she's also upset. Mm-hmm. I took a sip. Of- <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> so then she went from being upset to confused. <laughs> yes, right. like, what is going on with you? <laughs> <laughs> and that's when it all clicked she was like it's juice <laughs> and of course she's like you play too much <laughs> that is funny. That is. I'm a, listen I try to have fun in everything that I do and I mean like even like I said I go to this basketball club and they can't stand me because I'll be sitting there dancing instead of checking the ball but I try to find joy in everything that I do yes. um and <laughs> That was my that was one of my favorite stories. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what else? I did want to add I had some fun questions like you're a twin. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I feel like yeah, for people who aren't twins, it's just like, yeah, what is it like being a twin? <laughs> I feel like that's, but I feel like that's the like classic question, question you get all the time. <laughs> What is that well, like? we're fraternal. We're fraternal. But okay. I'll tell you one thing about my sister, and I hope she hears this. Uh, she's a bitch because I came, I was outed when I was like 11, 12. Oh, okay. My Ooh. sister didn't date. And I always thought she's asexual. No big deal. Mm-hmm. Like, I still love her. Mm-hmm. She comes out at like age 24 as she's about to get married to this woman. She's like, oh, by the way, I'm gay. Bye. <laughs> 
singing for years. Yes. Years by yourself. Yep. Just in the wind. Yep. And then she was like, oh, let me finally let them in on what I got going on. And I'm moving. I'm moving by. Uh, like, she she was like, I saw how she treated you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be good to put that question yep. in there. Yep. Mm-hmm. I love her so much. <laughs> She played that one right. <laughs> that is so oh, funny. Fun <laughs> Brittany, we really enjoyed this conversation. I'm so glad we had you on the podcast. Can you tell our listeners where they can get the book, where they can follow you to learn more and just to support your cause? Yes, yes, definitely. Well, thank you again so much for having me. I had a freaking blast. And um, my Instagram is at black underscore queer underscore nurse. Um, Twitter is just black queer nurse. And my website is uh, blackqueernurse.co without the M. Um, you can buy the book uh, from there. Uh, I have a link to my uh, di- that links directly to my publisher's website. Um, you can buy it anywhere. Um, I always recommend buying it from your local bookshops, your black owned bookshops, of course. So, um, but yeah, whatever makes you happy. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. If you would like to suggest a topic we should discuss or share your own personal story, email us at distrustanddisparities at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Please rate, review, and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Distrust and Disparities and on Twitter at Distrust Pod. Thank you.